Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to be joined today by Noel Joyce. Noel is the Design Director at Hacks, which is a hardware accelerator based out in China. So Noel is joining us from China today. Noel's also a, a, an accessibility advocate and wheelchair user. So Noel, it's, it's great to have you with us and it's great to be joined by someone that's been uh, referred to us through our, our, our wider accessibility community. So can you tell us a bit about yourself, how you, you, you came to be interested in the field and your story and, and of course what you're doing with Hacks. Oh, um, yeah, thanks, thanks Neil for having me um, uh, and Deborah and Antonio, thanks for, thanks for having me in, um, along uh, for, for, for a chat. Yeah, so uh, I suppose if I go back in history a little bit and tell you how I ended up talking to you guys through, through that story. Yes. Um, so uh, nearly 14 years ago, um, I had a, a, a mountain biking accident that uh, left me confined to a wheelchair. Prior to that, I was actually in the Irish military, um, and that um, that accident uh, basically put an end end to that career. Um, and while I was in rehabilitation, um, I looked at you know what can I do next? What can I do to to maybe um, uh, as a job, uh, you know. Uh, because I could no longer be a soldier. And um, I looked around and I looked at things like, um, when again in rehabilitation, you see a lot of people with very difficult circumstances and understand that, you know, maybe there's a job there. Maybe there's a job I can do that can help people with, with disabilities or, you know, work on, on things that can help people overall. So I looked around and I ended up then going back to um, college and studying industrial design and product design. And uh, it was while I was in college, I ended up um, working on uh, finding that this was an incredibly fulfilling career path to go on, but uh, also incredibly difficult um, because uh, design probably one of those things that it's not really a tangible thing till you see an outcome and then you try to put a monetary value to it. It's a very difficult thing to do as well. So it was while I was in college, I did, um, uh, did a lot of work sort of trying to um, get the idea of design out there in, in back home in Ireland, uh, especially from my own perspective, I didn't really have a choice to go and do other kinds of work. I had to go and do what I learned in college. Um, and uh, while I was in, in college, I actually um, uh, uh, entered in the Dyson Award as well, which, you know, James Dyson do, do, do this award every year. And um, I, I was uh, in the last 15 in the world for this. I designed a hydraulic wheelchair braking system. Um, mm -hmm. And that was a, one of my first project ideas that I worked on. Um, and that was in third year in college. But, you know, as I got towards the end of college, I realized it's going to be difficult to get a job. So that's when I started a collaborative with a number of other people doing design. And we, we sort of helped each other out getting different types of work. Um, and while I was doing that, then I ended up working on projects for, for individual people and found very quickly that it was very difficult to get people to understand the value of what we were doing. And that led me into uh, starting my own startups, which, um, which meant that I was developing my own physical hardware products that allowed me to understand everything from the sketch on a piece of paper right through to the logistics of delivering a product, uh, all the stuff like... Um, you know, online fulfillment, all, all the things dealing with factories, everything, everything you can think of from the second you start thinking about a project idea through to dealing with customers. So all these things, uh, you know, sort of culminated in, in a business that um, myself and a couple of other guys, another guy called Andy Shaw, we worked on together and we bootstrapped that from about 8,000 euros up to over, I think at one stage we, we, we had a million in sales. So it was it was pretty cool because we we learned a lot through that process. No no one becomes a millionaire by earning a million a million euros. By the way, just just so you, everyone understands, right? It's just like it sustained us and and we learned a lot from the process. Um, and it was while I was working on this project, I ended up uh, coming to China, and um, a guy named Sean O'Sullivan from SOS Ventures, who who uh, invested in another project that I, I had been working on asked me to come here and uh, help out with the program, the hacks program that had just started. And that's how I ended up working in China. And that was that was nearly seven years ago. Um, and since then, I've been working on, I've worked with maybe 300 odd startups on their projects from anything you can think of, uh, from industrial IoT sensors through to 
uh, cooking aids for the home and commercial products, robotics, anything you can think of, I've probably worked on at this stage uh, in the last seven years. And as well as that, I like to keep my hand in on working on different types of projects myself that will um, sort of make an impact uh, out in the world. And one of those was actually uh, an idea we worked on for monitoring the condition of footpaths. Um, uh, which was called Pavinet, but we can talk a little bit more about that. But that's how I got to here in, in, in the last uh, 14 years, we'll say. Excellent. Thank you. And, and, and yeah, Pavinet does look really interesting. You know, we we talk to a, a lot of people uh, who talk about the the inaccessibility of cities, and it's it's really basic things that, uh, you know, like the quality of the, the pavements and the sidewalks, et cetera. That, that can make a difference and, and you know just things like drop curbs can, can make a huge difference to cities. Uh, so we'll definitely talk about Parvenu shortly. Antonio, I know you have a question. No, I know. Great to have you here. Um, we have been uh, I've been collaborating in the, in the organization of AC Access Dublin for a couple of years and something that we notice is sometimes we have young developers just come out from the university who, who join the hackathon and they start to realize, wow, I could do, I could, there's so much that I can learn about working on accessibility, so much I can improve my code, uh, so many things I don't know about design that I, I feel I need to learn about it because nobody has ever mentioned this to me. So if you go back uh, to your early days when you, when you started working at SOS, SOS Ventures and, and, and then uh, coming back to today, what differences have you seen in when you have to talk about accessibility with the startups that you engage with, are you seeing an evolution? Uh, how is that conversation evolving? Um, around accessibility, I feel like that um, you know, I feel like that there's a there's a tipping point coming. Uh, I feel like people still don't get it entirely, but that's not that's not that's not the biggest problem. I think is. And again, I, I, I alluded to it in, in the talk I did a couple of months back, is the idea that we all end up with those problems anyways, right? And that's what I, I feel like I, I, I do a lot of work around now as well when I'm speaking to startups is, you know, you need to think about projects that are going to affect your future self, not just right now. And I think it, it requires that sort of um, change, this sort of mind shift towards, like, it's about, I suppose, appealing to people's selfishness right you know uh, you know today today you know people with disabilities have to deal with the problems they have to deal with but that is the future self of everyone and if you can tap into people's uh, fear uh, well i don't want to say fear selfishness right how they're going to feel later on then then that's that that that's that i think can be a powerful thing and what i try to do when i'm talking to startups that might be working on on uh, projects based around helping people with disabilities is that think about it from your own future selves perspective not from the person with the disability you're trying to help now and that that sort of strikes a stronger chord i think uh, because now it becomes more personal um, and w what I would have seen with startups previous, um, or, or anyone I would have talked to previous about this was I felt like that a lot of people didn't truly understand, and I don't think it's their fault. And I think that we've had a huge amount of, uh, um, there's been sort of a proliferation of um, like goodwill projects, projects that people, they do because they think it's going to help, but in reality, it furthers their own, um, it furthers their own sort of identity, their own sort of uh, their own sort of uh, status as someone who's developed a product to help people with disabilities, but it might not make sense for anyone with a disability because they don't truly understand. But that's fine too. I don't I don't have a problem with that, right? Like I mean, it it means the conversation is there and something's happening, but it's about maybe trying to channel that in the correct directions now. You know, so okay. I think it is changing, but it's changing slowly. I'm going to be slightly curmudgeonly and say, okay, it's okay to not have a problem with that the first time. If they do it repeatedly, then then that, that yeah. becomes problematic. So so uh, you know because we we often say you know nothing about us without us because you know we, it, it should be about working with with the community rather than assuming. But we all make mistakes and people do do this stuff with the best of intentions so so yeah. you're right we, we 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 don't want to go in finger pointing 
from the outset. It's only sort of when they repeatedly, <laughs> we had yeah. this repeated behavior. And the other thing I'm, I'm going to say is a sort of like, almost as a gift, rather than fear, let's talk about enlightened self-interest. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, self, yeah, selfishness. I mean, let's pay the, pay the correctly here, dude. Like, I mean, yeah. I don't mind saying this to people. Like, like uh, I've said it to people. You're all going to end up disabled. You should be listening to us, right? That's the the bottom yeah. line. You're not. You're you don't get out of this alive. And when you do get to those later stages, you're going to end up with issues. So you need. But people don't want to understand their own future fallibilities, and they don't want to believe that this is going to happen to them, right? So it's it becomes one of those things where. We have to um, uh, we'll figure out what that language is that people get used to the idea and you know and, and understand it. And I feel like that um, for me, like yeah, look, I get annoyed about it as well. Like believe me, I've lost. <laughs> like I, I, rarely do people come to me with ideas for disability anymore because they know they're just going to enter into like a, a storm of rage, right? <laughs> so it's like you know, I'm, I'm always like you know you haven't really thought about this or blah 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 but what i would what i try to do is hold back from that and just go okay let, let's look at it from a different perspective um and i think that that's why like uh, when i'm thinking about projects now um and and i'm thinking about um disability uh, it's 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 almost how can i take this thing this this thing that that affects people with disabilities and make it something that's broader than just people with disabilities and therefore get people to understand that this is something that affects them so that that's a bigger thing and it doesn't become and it's no longer than something that they're doing because they feel like they're going to be morally superior or um, increase their social standing uh, as a result of it they're doing it because they have to do it because it's for their future selves right so um it's it's i i just try to think about i know maybe a little bit more positively, maybe overly positively, but I don't know, it, it might work. Uh, we'll see. I, I might come back to being curmudgeonly as well in, in, in a little while, you know? Yeah, generally speaking, we've, we accentuate the positive here. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Deborah, did you, did you have a question? I know you've um, been having I'm, trouble with your uh, internet. I'm not sure if y'all will be, yeah, I'm we not can hear sure you. if y'all can hear me. Be can hear you. Can y'all can y'all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hello. Did you have a question? Yeah. Hello. Yes, we can uh, hear you. I, Did you I, have I a question? My okay. Uh, I do have questions, but my internet is so bad, so I'm not going to answer. I'm not going to ask any questions. Okay. Okay. So, 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 no. Um, tell us a bit, a bit, a bit more about Parvenu. Okay, so I, I'll tell you the story behind that as well, because I think it's important to get the background of why. Um, uh, so uh, it was maybe about four years ago, um, and I wasn't feeling too good myself, and. Um, I felt, I thought that I was, uh, you know, just overworked and tired from working and I thought, okay, you know, I'll go to the doctor and, you know, find out, is there anything wrong? And I went to the doctor and she told me I was type 2 diabetic or pre-diabetic at that time. And um, I was, she said, here's, this is the medication you need to take to manage the condition. And I was, I thought, look, is there a way I can do this without medication, right? Is there a way I can resolve this situation? Because pancreas still works. It's just, I'm going down the wrong path here. Is there a way we can stop this? Um, and she told me about a diet called the Newcastle diet. And um, this diet involved in losing a, a lot of weight, um, getting a lot more exercise and, and um, 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 uh, sort of, change of diet as well so I went and did this and the 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 diet and the losing of the weight goes with the diet obviously and the exercise um the the exercise is the big problem 
because you know wheeling the wheelchair was probably the biggest thing I could do. I was doing it all day long. I could do it. I could do it more frequently. Things like going to the gym or swimming and things like that just require so much more time as a person with a disability because the preparation time as well as actually doing it is is, is part of it, right? So I, wheeling wheeling my chair was the the thing I taught to do. So I'd go out and I'd wheel my chair around. And then all the vibration and impact would cause me a lot of pain. And I would come home and it was either succumb to the disease or succumb to the pain. Which one do you, which one is the, the better of the two bad things? So <clears throat> I thought to myself, well, if this is a problem for me, then it's a problem for everyone that has a disability, that they are dealing with these. And it's not just big impacts, right, that, that people deal with. It's actually all these little tiny buzzes, this this sort of uh, low, this, this high amount of low frequency vibration that passes up through the chair that causes a lot of pain. Um, and I thought like, okay, there's a lot of these little things, not big impacts, but little curbs and bumps that are, that are a big issue. And, and I, I thought if I can map those things and maybe um, I can map where is good to go in a wheelchair. And if I can map where is good to go, then I can show other people with disabilities that, that that's that's okay to go there. And then if we're able to see those maps, we're able to see where is not accessible just by being able to see where people would, went in wheelchairs. But what started to happen then was, you know, um, when I looked at that, I was, can can we identify individual impact points and therefore be able to gather data around them and maybe we can make an impact in the world through, through that by actually repairing those individual impact points and what we did was um, start mounted some sensors on the chair that we were able to see all the vibrational impacts coming up through the chair and then did some video that we were able to um, basically we were able to overlay uh, onto that data and have this set of digital breadcrumbs that told us where all these impact points were um and then we were able to look at those g-forces and the reference to those g-forces was able to sort of tell us whether it was uh, was not only whether it was um an impact that would affect someone with a disability or in a wheelchair but also whether it was a trip and fall hazard which is a even bigger problem right so um i went to my local authorities and said oh hey guys i have this brilliant information that can help you to fix all the footpaths right um, and it's going to be awesome because, you know, people with disabilities won't need to suffer anymore on the footpaths. And they were like, well, you need to talk to, you know, the local disability authorities and stuff like that in order to get those things repaired because we just don't have the money. And I was like, well, it's your job. It's not their job to do this. Right. So I, I, I went I went back and I had a look at things again. And I was sort of like, this isn't right that the people with disabilities must endure this stuff. And it's not right that the disability authorities or whoever may be are the ones that should be are should be are going to be out fixing footpaths when it's it's the local authorities job to do that so that's when it became incredibly powerful to be able to tell them that these were trip and fall hazards because now they were public liability issues they weren't accessibility issues anymore they became things that if someone tripped and fell on it then they you know the the, the local authority could be sued for for um, for maybe 25,000 euros in a lot of cases in Ireland, they settle, they settle out of court. Um, so it became now not something that they, they, they could take the risk of not doing anything about the piece of information they knew about. Um, and that's when they actually started to fix footpaths, when we so told them it was a public liability issue, not when it was an accessibility issue. So what we what we did then was we we started to um, just gather some data and, and deliver it to them. Um, and we got a number of um, areas in our local town repaired, the footpaths repaired. And uh, they hate to see, like any anytime there's any work going on in town now, they hate to see me coming because it's like, oh no, this guy, he's going to give us some, he's going to give us some trouble about these footpaths again, you know. Um, so that's how, that's how it, it came about. Um, the thing was though, it, it so when someone's job depends on not knowing what a problem is, then they'll do their best to avoid uh, any information around it. And we've found it incredibly hard to try and get um, local authorities involved in actually taking this information from us. Well, essentially, we were trying to sell it to them because you're trying to make a business from this, right? Yeah. So um, it's been an incredibly difficult thing to do, and we're sort of it's slowed down quite a lot. But that's fine because. I know too that 
from the perspective of what, what we did on our own town, there will never be a footpath installed that isn't put in correctly because the fear is there now that they have to do it, right? That they know that there's someone watching out. And I do believe, like, ultimately, I, my, my vision for this would be that literally we'd have robots that, you know, move around the footpaths and are able to detect all these obstacles and just uh, they're able to gather that data and it's delivered to local authorities and they have to react instantly to it. And then accessibility occurs as a result. And I don't think that's far away, right? When you think about delivery robots that are able to deliver pizzas or groceries or whatever it might be, then it's not far away, right? It's not entirely outside the realm of possibility to do things like this, especially when you think about the demographics of the planet and the way they are changing. That there's going to be not just people with disabilities today suffering with those issues, but everyone in the future. Um, and that's what I think about it is like, again, going back to that whole idea, if you can go to a local authority and talk to a, you know, a, like a, a counselor and explain to them that, look, your future self is going to suffer from these problems too, then it becomes a different story. So that's, that's sort of where it, it, that journey has, has come to. Um, and I also feel like it, there's a monetary value in that information, right? It's not just about whether someone with a disability can manage in that footpath. I think the data is incredibly um, valuable to companies who do have ground delivery robots, because now those robots know where they can and can't go. They don't just yeah. have to, you know, they don't, they don't have to depend on a guy going out and driving the robot around first before it knows it can go there. Uh, it already can have that information because someone in a wheelchair already managed to, to move around there. And that's why, like, I think that these things are incredibly powerful, right? That that people with disability has disabilities have this incredible insight that um, that can actually increase the value of the data that's gathered because they're suffering with problems that are that not everyone else suffers with. And it's why, like, again, I talked about that at the event uh, at Inspirefest is that we can see the future. We can we can we can see uh, the problems before they occur, and we we experience things that other people just will never understand. And if we can gather that data, then we can make a bigger impact on the world and make a bigger impact for everyone in the future. Yeah, no, and I think that's um, that's definitely to the point. And 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 often we talk about how the challenges of disability actually lead to innovation. You know, look at all of the technology that surrounds us every day now, and, and actually most of the stuff originally started out, out life as an assistive technology. So I'm, I'm immediately thinking, so I, I, I just spent the, the week over, uh, some of the week over in Munich at a startup event that, that we were participating in, and I was with our Smart Cities lead. And I'm thinking about, well, yeah, well, you can, acquire, uh, you can apply the data that you've just acquired for pavements and, and, and sidewalks, but you could also look at that for predictive maintenance of, of yeah. roads as well. And so then you're, you're, you're talking about, a, you know, potentially, you know, quite a, a huge ROI for the city. So it's not just about compliance and, and mitigation of risk, but it's also about how do you better manage your limited resources as a, yeah. a, as, exactly. as a city? Um, how can you, you know, do the sort of stitch in time maintenance that means that you don't ever have to be having huge potholes and closing down ro roads for, for, you know, which then cost, you know, not only the council or the, the city lots of money, but have an impact on the overall economic success. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so those kind of things, they're, they're, they're difficult to quantify sometimes, but, but those things are, you know, are, are things that, that the people that are making decisions within cities will understand. So again, you're seeing benefits from the insights that have been brought about through disability. Mm -hmm. um, Deborah's having problems with her internet, but she left a question for you. Um, and and she, she says, because you're working in China, she wants to know, and you've been working there for a while, she wants to know how things have changed uh, you know, in, in the, the last couple of decades. Um, I know so, from working with the with the IPC that that the 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 Olympics and Paralympics was a catalyst for imp improving stuff. But but what have you seen and what have you experienced in terms of disability inclusion? 
Um, so I'm I'm working in a city called Shenzhen. It's just north of Hong Kong. Um, yes. And um, it's a very new city. It's it's very young city. But uh, I have to say that accessibility. Uh, there's a lot there seems to be more recently there's been a lot more sort of like when I go to a metro station for example there's someone there to help people that wasn't there two years ago um, I see a lot more dish curbs but there's still it's just such a massive place and such a young city there's so there's not many people it's a city as well that was born out of um, uh, manufacturing industry so there's not very many people with disabilities we'd say um, a lot of people would have come from the countryside and, and, and worked in factories from around the place. But as the city grows and become and, and, and there's an indigenous population from the city, not from outside the city, you do see more, you know, a few more people with disabilities and things like that. The area I'm working in is called Huachan Bay. It's in, in um, they, they, they refer to this area as almost like the, the Silicon Valley of Asia, the new Silicon Valley because of, you know, the, the startup culture and all the rest that's going on here. But the area in Huachan Bay, there's a lot of electronics markets and everything is, is, is moved around by trolleys. So they've ramps everywhere. It's completely accessible by accident. It, it's been done for a capitalist reason. It was never meant to be like that, right? But everywhere that they have to bring a trolley, they have to build a ramp. So I can get around this place like, like it's a nobody's business. And it's funny because I think people in wheelchairs would think no one in their right mind would go to to China or parts of China because it's just not, they don't feel it's accessible. Mm -hmm. But it's surprising how accessible this area has become. Now I did, re you know, when you go to older cities, like recently I've been in Xi'an, a lot of places are not accessible, you know, um, it can be quite difficult. Um, and then the, as well as that, uh, there's the culturally, it, it tends to be a little bit more difficult as well. Disability is not something that, that is seen as, uh, you know, something that needs to be helped that often. Like, like a lot of people with disabilities here, I would suggest end up in a situation where they don't really do much or go anywhere. Um, so it's not really, a, like a talked about as much, but I think from external influence outside of the country, because I, I feel like that they're trying to make a big effort, right? Because again, they, they've got a demographic that's changing as well, right? And everyone is in the same boat. Yes. So there is a big effort being made. Um, and I think that, that things are changing and they're changing very rapidly and very positively. Yeah, if anything, their demographics is even more scary because of because of yeah. the one child policy that they had for a long time so yeah. there's just not going to be the 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 young population to support it antonio i know you've got a question as well no uh because in, in china the way our people interact online is through a series of tools and solutions that are completely different from the ones that we use uh in our part of the world you now especially we chat has a huge impact in the way our people interact and consume mm. Do you have a perspective how people with disabilities uh, use those tools, are able to use those solutions, how that can impact their lives? Uh, do you have any insights on that? Um, I find that like, because I don't really, I don't use, I only use WeChat really for communicating with other people here. I don't really use the tools inside of it that much, but from what I see, it's an incredibly convenient platform. And with the advent of uh, AI, it's becoming even more and more powerful. Um, and even to go into local stores here, for example, you can pay for stuff with your face now, right? So even if you like had a visual impairment, um, as long as you are, able to know where that device is, you're able to pay with your face, right? So these kinds of things that are happening here, um, I think China's leading the way on them. There's a lot of people worried about that kind of technology, but I think it's it's incredibly empowering. And I think that what happens here a lot of the time is um, people just get behind it. They don't, they don't question it as much as maybe we would, right? And we'd worry about data protection and whatnot because there's such a, uh, holistic view of how data is handled here and whatnot. Um, the, I don't think there's the, the same barriers to these technologies being developed. In fact, I think that there is some instances where technologies that would be beneficial to people with disabilities uh, and impairments will be developed quicker just because it, it becomes more prolific faster. Whereas, you know, similar stuff at home might not happen as quickly because people worry about you know, I don't want people to know my face when I'm paying for stuff or going through an airport or whatever it might be. 
I think that's a, a, a valid point. We we also see the the cultural differences in in terms of how sustainability might be approached. So, you know, at the moment, yes, China is burning a lot of brown coal, but they're also the world's largest manufacturer of photovoltaic cells, and you know, they're building battery factories all over the place. Yeah, the the, the completely different way that the society is governed also enables them to implement sweeping technological changes in a way that we just don't do just in the West. Can't do it. Yeah, yeah. And I just read an article recently that in Shanghai, what they started to do is, um, um, from a recycling perspective, uh, they pay they they'll pay a small amount of people uh, amount of money to people to sort their trash into different bins and make sure it's clean so it can be recycled more quickly, um, and it can be recycled much more efficiently, right? And whereas I don't know what it's like for you guys, but in Ireland you have to pay a guy to come and collect your trash. You've already sorted it to some degree, and then they um, actually make money from the recycled materials when they sell it later on, right? So it's like. There, there seems to be different ways of doing things that encourage people to sort of get on board with things, whereas it's a little bit different from the perspective of the way we do things, right? And I think that there's like a there's there's definitely a sense of community here that's different, a pride as well. Like, and I think that when when the tipping point comes for different things that need to happen from an accessibility perspective or helping people with disabilities, everyone gets on board. Everyone gets behind it. You know, and when it happens, it happens fast, and it it just becomes matter of fact. It's no longer a problem, right? It's just matter of fact that it's solved, and and that's the way we're going to do it from now on. Um, and a lot of people don't agree with that kind of way of things being done, but I've seen things being done here in 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 the last seven years that were remarkable. Like, I mean, they've built a metro system in this city alone for twelve million people in ten years, right? It, it's incredible. We can't. In Ireland, we can't get a tram line from the airport into the city. <laughs> I don't know how long we've been, you know, these things have been going on, right? So it's the pace, the pace here is frightening. And um, when I go home and I talk to people about it, and it's like, oh yeah, it's great and all, but I wouldn't like to live like that. But you know, people need to, they need to, they need to sort of take notice of this. They can't just, you can't just ignore that this stuff is happening, you know. No, I, I, I. I... Seen similar when you know I, I travelled at Christmas time to to Thailand, and uh, we we stayed on the forty third floor of a tower block that had not been there a year before. Yeah, yeah, it, it would take several years for that to have been built in the West. You know, these things mm -hmm. are being thrown up now. You know, you, you maybe want to look the other way about building codes and. <laughs> some yeah, of this well, stuff but but but, yeah. but uh but at the same time it yeah it's indicative of the the, the you know the pace of change and i think you're right that um there is a, a, a you know a societal difference about it sort of yeah you know, once it's decided that's it you know and and it's it's not undecided it's not yeah. you know there's no sort of flip-flopping and and reversing of decisions and and so on so yeah i i, I think it's but it's how do you how do you reach how do you get to that tipping point that I think is is interesting, you know who are the yeah. people that influence those decisions about accessibility uh, that that convince people that that this is the thing that that they that needs to be done. Yeah, certainly the case, and that that's why like I I think about the approach to it, it has to be it's about. It's not like for me personally, it's not about going, look, I have a disability and you need to listen to me. I'm, I'm telling you, it's terrible for everyone with disabilities. It's about your future self, right? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, the things that we do today and the decisions we make today will affect you in the future. The things that you ask us to help you with. And that's why I refer to this idea where people with disabilities can tell the future. They're already living the future, right? It might be a negative future, right? But if you make that future, if you make their current lives better, then your future is better, right? You, you, your your ability to live your best life for longer is there because you've engaged in that situation, right? And um, that's what you know. That's what I think is, uh, and 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 I think about it as well. Like I mean, not just from the perspective of that we can, and to speak to your point about predictive maintenance, what about predictive building, right? Like what about you know? 
if you know that a certain area has a demographic of X, Y, Z, um, and you know that the footpaths are not correct, or there's a certain amount of buildings that are a problem, you know, that you're able to make sure that that future area of the city is already accounted for before that problem arises. Right? Yeah. So it becomes, you know, all those things can be changed. They can, you know, through, through this kind of uh, forward thinking and understanding, and then being able to apply meaningful, um, meaningful sort of uh, uh, solutions before the problem even arises, right? Being yeah. able to predict it before it occurs. Um, and again, I go back to the whole idea that people with disabilities, because they plan more effectively, they live a life where they cannot leave anything to chance. They are probably the better armed people for helping to realize those uh, solutions for those problems. So yeah. it's, 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 I think that there's, uh, and, and that's why like, uh, I, I, I like to look at it from the perspective, how can I help people to understand what it is for them, what it is going to be about for them, not about my current set of circumstances. Uh, but I still have not found like I found the screws to turn, but maybe I'm using a hammer instead of a screwdriver, right? So I need yeah. to, I need to figure out how to get people to go. Okay, right, th I, this guy is doing this or thinking this way for my good, not because you know he's angry or whatever it might yes, be. Yes, you know? indeed, brilliant. So we've we've time flown, and we're we're at the end of our half hour. It's been a real pleasure talking with you, Noel. Um, it's been enlightening to to learn about the stuff that's going on in other parts of the world because all too often we focus on uh, on the stuff in, in the West. I need to thank the, obviously MyClearText and Barclays and Microlink for helping keep us sustainable and, and keeping the, the wheels on the bus and, and making sure that we're accessible. Um, and we look forward to you joining us on Twitter for the chat. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.